The English language features a lot of sayings about fortune or fate. You've got fortune favours the bold. May the odds be ever in your favour. All that kind of thing. And they all boil down to the same thing. Fortune may or may not give you a boost. So in this week's episode, we're going to meet Fortuna, who was the goddess of luck, abundance and fate. And she's the woman that you want to speak to if you want some luck sprinkled on your lottery ticket, if you want a promotion at work or whatever it is that you're looking for. And if you've never encountered Fortuna, then let me introduce you in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are moving into fortune telling month because it's now March. And this did come about because of an incredibly scientific poll that I ran on Twitter about what people would rather hear about. I did have two options. It was fortune telling or ancient Egypt and fortune telling one. I will, however, still be doing ancient Egypt at some point later in the year, I'm guessing. And I want to try and focus on maybe slightly more obscure deities that people possibly won't be as familiar with maybe i might do mummification and all that kind of stuff who knows if you've got a request please do let me know as i say this month we're going to be looking at fortune telling so i thought it was a good idea to start off with fortuna who's basically like the goddess of luck and so on and that's essentially why you tell fortunes isn't it it's because you want to know what's going to happen to you so that's why i thought fortuna would be a really good one to start with we will also be looking at the folklore of tarot cards the folklore of playing cards because they're actually quite different and then we're going to have an episode on like all the weird types of divination that people have used to try and tell the future so that's things like watching which way birds fly and then divining what that might possibly mean so that should be quite a fun episode as well so let's get on with this week's episode and let's go and meet fortuna so who was fortuna she was the roman goddess of chance and luck and she started out as an Italian farming deity, most often linked with prosperity. Thalia Tuck notes that as a fertility goddess, she would bring prosperity and abundant harvests. And it would mean, obviously, if you cared for animals and so on, that you would have plenty of baby animals every spring. So the links to her newer job role basically existed in her old one, because obviously there's a lot of links between abundance and prosperity and then good luck and good fortune and so on. And evidence does suggest that people worship Fortuna during Rome's earliest days, if not even earlier. And at some point, I mean, and did change. This was possibly when she was identified with the Greek goddess, Taika. I've probably mispronounced that, so I do apologise. But Taika was responsible for fortune, chance and fate. And like Fortuna, she would eventually become associated with Lady Luck in more secular times. Now, Fortuna is a fascinating figure because ultimately she represents so many things. She's also not entirely positive, but she's also not entirely negative either, which pretty much sums up the nature of chance. Some people consulted her about the future and some temples actually featured oracles which would divine people's fortune. So divination has been going on probably, I would imagine, in some form or another as long as there's been people because people like to know what's coming so they can be best prepared for it and fortune tellers are obviously quite popular as a result. Now, as Jupiter is firstborn, obviously Jupiter being essentially the head of the gods, so he's the Roman equivalent of Zeus in the Greek pantheon, Fortuna enjoyed extensive worship in Italy and she had major shrines at Prinesta and Antium and her day is often considered June the 11th but the festival of Fors Fortuna and Fors Fortuna is like another version of Fortuna that fell on June the 24th and offerings were sent by boat along the river Tiber to her shrines as part of the festivities and the festivities when you read about them do sound pretty impressive because people just liked fortuna so much and they wanted to really honor her obviously if you honor a goddess of good luck you are definitely hoping for some in return but this is how it worked you might find fortuna's altars in bathhouses where romans like to gamble because obviously as goddess of luck and chance she also became the goddess of gambling as well Now, she's sometimes shown holding a cornucopia, which helps to demonstrate abundance. In some depictions, she's holding it upright and it's full. In other depictions, she's actually tipping it out and bestowing blessings on whoever's 
basically sitting underneath it. And she might also have her hand on a rudder, which shows her control of destiny. And occasionally she stands on top of a ball, which represents how easily fortunes can change and how basically precarious life is. In other representations, she presides over the Wheel of Fortune, which is where if you do read tarot cards, you've probably seen Fortuna on the card, the Wheel of Fortune. That's generally where she appears. Sometimes Fortuna is seen as fickle or even malignant, but I can't help thinking a lot of that with sour grapes. So if you didn't get the promotion that you wanted because you're awful to work with, it was easier to blame Fortuna for not giving you the promotion. And if you didn't catch a break when you were gambling, rather than it being just because you were gambling and therefore likely to lose, again, you could say, oh no, Fortuna has it in for me. So she basically becomes a way to absolve yourself of personal responsibility. That being said, some artists depicted her as wearing a blindfold, which would represent blind luck, because let's be honest, she didn't really care who she was bestowing good or bad fortune on. It was all down to the luck of the draw, because that's the point of it. And she is spoken of by nearly all the Roman writers as blind, inconstant, unjust and delighting in mischief. So there's an idea that some people thought at the time that she actually enjoyed causing havoc with the way that she bestowed luck at random. But again, that's just the random nature of chance. But despite all of this, she was a huge favourite with the slaves because she could grant freedom or riches. And you did occasionally hear of rags to riches transformation tales and Fortuna was largely the deity responsible for them. The thing I think people sometimes forget is that Roman slaves could actually buy their own freedom and then go on and do extra stuff in, in the society, as it were. So it was entirely possible to have quite humble beginnings and rise to slightly dizzying heights. So again, you would thank Fortuna for all of the, the good luck that she gave you on the way. Some depictions of Fortuna actually show her with wings, but Thalia Tuck relates a myth made popular by the Romans, which explained why she didn't have any. And the Romans basically create an awful lot of origin myths for Rome to justify its role in the wider world. So they have the whole idea of being founded by a boy who was raised by a wolf to indicate why people should bow down to Rome. And in this particular one, Fortuna arrived in Rome and immediately took off her shoes and removed her wings, saying that Rome was her true home and she would never leave it. Now, Fortuna does appear in different forms, which reflects the different types of luck that there are. So Fortuna Dubia is dubious fortune. Fortuna Brevis is fickle fortune. And Fortuna Mala is bad fortune. And they're the main three, but there's tons of them. And for example, women might celebrate Fortuna Virilis, which obviously is about being sort of fertile and, and it's about virility, really. And farmers might favour Fortuna Ananaria. So there are dozens of varieties, but I'm not going to list them all here. But there is actually a, white, a longer list of them on Thalia Tuck's website, which the link is in the original blog post that this episode is for. Some evidence does actually link Fortuna with Isis in ancient Egypt as Isis Fortuna in that wonderful ancient world way of creating new deities. My favourite example of that is Serapis, who's created from Apis and Osiris, and he was found in Thonis Heraklion in Egypt. And if you didn't see it, there was a fantastic exhibition about Thonis Heraklion at the British Museum a few years ago. And it was fantastic seeing the old world kind of swapsies that they had going on with these different deities. So, you know, you might go and worship a Greek deity one day and an Egyptian one the next day because it depended on what you needed. But as you might imagine, plenty of poets and writers evoke Fortuna more than most. Shakespeare had a go, she pops up in the work of Ovid, and she also appears in chapter 25 of Machiavelli's The Prince. And what I find really interesting in this one is he thinks that Fortuna only controls half of a human's fate, the other half being down to a person's actions. And he says, and I quote, I judge that may be assumed as true that fortune to the extent of one half is the arbiter of our actions, but that she permits us to direct the other half, or perhaps a little less, ourselves, end quote. So, at least Machiavelli, more than anyone else, recognised the power of personal responsibility. So you couldn't necessarily say all of your woes were down to Fortuna. Half of them were. But anyway... One thing I wanted to focus on is Fortuna worship in Roman Britain, because when the Romans turned up to Britain, they obviously bring their own gods with them. They, as, as always, they do a spot of swapsies, exchanging their gods with ours, and they then start creating new gods in various places. For example, the most famous one that I can think of is Sullis Minerva, 
who's a combination of the Celtic water deity Sullis and the Roman goddess Minerva, and they're basically put together to make Sullis Minerva, who is the patron goddess of Bath. But Fortuna was one of these goddesses that made the leap into Roman Britain. And you can sort of understand why, because if you're moving to a brand new country that's sort of famous for having a horrible climate and so on, you would you would want all the luck you could get, really. So I can absolutely understand why they would why they would do this. And obviously, because of the particular neck of the woods where I live, we've got a lot of Roman forts along Hadrian's Wall. And obviously, every time you find a fort, there's a bathhouse and there's often an altar have to Fortuna having been found in that bathhouse. One of the examples is Risingham Fort and the altar there is actually now at the Great Museum North, which is also known as the Hancock Museum, if you're my age, which is in Newcastle. So you can still see these altars actually in museums and so on. But it just demonstrates that obviously the idea of worship and Fortuna in bathhouses went from Rome to Britain. Now, Fortuna didn't actually make this leap alone. She did move with her male counterpart, Bonus Aventus. Now, his name actually means a good outcome, but his ability to bestow good luck was limited to specific events, which basically means that actually between the two of them, Fortuna was the more powerful deity, although it's Jupiter's firstborn. You can kind of understand why. Now, only two dedications to Bonus Aventus actually exist in Britain, in Caerleon and York. And both of these dedications are to both Bonus Aventus and Fortuna, and both sites were also central to the Roman Legion. And it's not hard to see why an army might want some good luck. Elsewhere, the dedications of Fortuna are often just to her. And evidence of her worship has actually been found as far north as Castlecarry in Scotland. Dedications have also been found at Vindolanda, Chester's and Birderswald, which are all sites along Hadrian's Wall. Vindolanda in particular is one of my favourites. And dedications are also found in Chester, Bowes, Lanchester and Manchester, among others. And in Binchester, which is near Bishop Auckland, archaeologists again found an altar to her at a bathhouse. So again, obviously quite a lot of gambling going on among the Roman Legion. Now, there was also a statue found at Birderswald, which shows Fortuna dressed in British clothing styles, not Roman. So she was either made here by a Roman with no interest in fashion or by a Briton who'd never actually seen Roman clothes. I have a feeling it was probably more likely the latter. There's also a sandstone carving of Fortuna found in the Great Museum North in Newcastle-Pontine, and it was actually found in the river. And this is the kind of thing that you find with the Romans. They often drop altars or statues into rivers as a form of offering. There are two altars to Neptune and Oceanus, obviously, again, both Roman deities, and they were found where the current swing bridge is in Newcastle. They were found in the Tyne there, so they're also in the museum as well. But it, it, it's an idea that they've basically made a, a, an offering to the spirits and the gods through the river. And this is where, obviously, Fortuna, this this sandstone relief of her, which is quite crudely carved, but you can still recognise the cornucopia and you can still recognise that she's got a hand on the rudder, so you would know instantly which goddess this was. Now, from here, Fortuna actually seems to have passed into a more common usage in a way that some of the other deities don't. I mean, I know we still have a lot of the stuff about Cupid and people still refer to Venus and so on, but, you know, even, like, a really important god like Jupiter seems to have sort of fallen by the wayside a little bit. So it tends to be other gods, potentially like Mars and so on, who still have some kind of role to play. But Fortuna is really the one that I think we see most often, and she usually pops up as Lady Luck. And Fortune Favours the Brave is even an official motto for the United States Naval Academy classes of 1985, 2004 and 2012. And obviously don't forget the Wheel of Fortune in the tarot deck where she pops up. And as I say, we will be looking at tarot cards next week. So despite her apparent whimsy, which people have a go at her for, the Romans still certainly felt compelled to pay homage to Fortuna. And the number of altars to her in Britain proves that she was obviously important enough to them to take her with them to a new land. Although, let's be honest, it's entirely possible that they were just asking for better luck when it came to the weather. So what I want to know is, have you ever come across Fortuna before? What would you ask her for? And how many times have you heard phrases like Lady Luck and so on? And, and, you know, Fortune Favour and the Bold and all that kind of thing. I do think it's quite fascinating the way that she's moved into popular culture in that particular way. And while we're doing fortune telling this week, and obviously there's not necessarily fortune telling in Fortuna, I think the fact that people were praying to a goddess for good luck 
and abundance and all that kind of thing is basically what people do fortune telling for in the first place and obviously there were oracles that would tell people's fortunes at her temple so I do think that there is that link between them there. As I say though because obviously Fortuna does kind of appear in the tarot deck we're going to look at the tarot cards next week and they're a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. I will speak to you next week and in the meantime I hope you have an absolutely fabulous week. Cheerio!